have a quorum and our apologies have been sent from Keith Buchanan. So you're very welcome obviously to this meeting in the very strange and difficult circumstances and we're all socially distant. Um, just make sure we remain so then throughout the meeting. Um, today we will be considering ministerial briefing um, for COVID-19 um, should be providing an update and also a discussion on budget 2020-2021 and we'll also then be considering some subordinate legislation. Um, if you move then through to um, page five, there's a clerk's memo and that's regarding um, committee agreement on strategic planning. Um, the committee agreed at our strategic planning meeting to put um, sort of future planning of what we were going to be doing and the committee's work on hold in light of the coronavirus crisis. At that meeting, the committee made a number of interim decisions, and these are at paragraph four of the clerk's memo. Are members content to agree, or have you any further comments in relation to those? Agreed. 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 Okay, thank you. Um, moving then to draft minutes at page seven, and that's for the meeting of the 11th of March. Are members content? Agreed. Thank you. Moving then to matters arising um, from the meeting of the 11th of March, and that's at page 12. Um, members have any issues or anything that they wish to comment on with regards to that? At page 14, there's a document detailing all instances during the COVID-19 health crisis where members indicated that they agreed to committee staff issuing correspondence or providing responses. Um, given the SL1 sent to members for consideration last week, this has now been updated and the new version is tabled at page three. Under the new standing order, um, 115, the committee agreed to make non-coronavirus related decisions by correspondence. Are members content to ratify those decisions? Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We then on to the ministerial briefing. Um, there are a range of pap um, papers which are relevant to the minister's briefing from page 20 of your pack. Um, and just for members' um, information, Hansard will also be recording the meeting. And we'll be welcoming the, the minister, Nicola Mallon, um, Katrina Godfrey, Department Secretary, John McGrath, the Deputy Secretary for Transport and Resources, and Gary Boyd, Director of Finance. Um, members should be aware that the Minister has around an hour with us this morning. Um, Minister um, and colleagues, officials, you're all very welcome to, um, I suppose, what's really quite an extraordinary meeting for us um, in the circumstances that we're dealing with. So you're very welcome to the meeting. Um, and I understand that you wish to make a statement. Yes, thank you, thank you, Chair, and thank you for the opportunity to meet with the committee today. Uh, and I do welcome the opportunity to provide members with an update uh, on the ways in which my department is contributing to the fight against COVID-19 and obviously my department's budget position uh, as well. Uh, as you have very kindly said, I do only have uh, an hour this morning, and I am also mindful that I have made written statements and that I gave quite a comprehensive update to the ad hoc committee. Uh, which you were all um, present at. So I want to keep my opening remarks uh, as brief as possible so that I can answer the questions that you have. And my officials will be available for further discussion this morning on the budget process, you know, as agreed, if you require it. Um, look, it goes without saying, this is not uh, an easy time for any of us. And it is unimaginably difficult for those individuals who are fighting COVID-19 and for those families who have sadly lost a loved one to this dreadful virus. Uh, protecting our citizens, our key workers, addressing the unique challenges presented by coronavirus and our recovery and renewal from it requires us all to work together and to think and to act differently. These are extraordinary times and thanks to the extraordinary work being undertaken across our communities, we continue to see positive signs that our health service is coping and that social distancing measures are working. But it is so important that we don't become complacent and that we all continue to play our part. In my oral statement to the Ad Hoc Committee on the 16th of April, I outlined many of the specific ways in which my department is helping in the fight against COVID-19. Those include maintaining public transport, water and wastewater infrastructure, delivery of services in a safe way, 
and the work that we have been doing with our colleagues in health to support the wider health effort. And we are particularly pleased that we were able to offer up our MOT centres um, as COVID testing centres. Since then, my department has continued to adapt and innovate to meet the evolving needs of our citizens. Some of these new or updated interventions since the ad hoc committee include a support package for ferry operators. Uh, members will have seen the announcement last week that we have a package jointly funded by the executive and the Department for Transport. This support will help keep our vital supply chains, our foods, medicines and other supplies open during the COVID-19 emergency. Discussions are also ongoing with the Treasury in respect of our airports. Legislation implementing changes to the process for major planning applications, the temporary removal of the requirement to hold a face-to-face -face public event as part of the pre-application community consultation. This is not in any way to remove the need for public consultation, which is a critical part of the planning process. This is about doing community consultation in a different way during this crisis, in line with the clear public health advice. This will allow major planning applications to continue to be submitted during the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, supporting our economy and keeping our eye uh, focused on recovery. We have also introduced new provisions that permit the automatic renewal of PSV bus licences without a prior roadworthiness test, where a current licence is in place or has recently expired. And members will also be aware that the DVA's MOT centre in Craigavon has joined those in Belfast and Newton Ards as a location for important increased COVID-19 testing. We do, of course, face further challenges where solutions are needed to protect our essential supply chains and to keep essential workers connected. Indeed, in this constantly evolving situation, fresh challenges arrive, arise on an almost daily basis. And I can assure the committee that we are working tirelessly to try to find innovative and appropriate solutions and to implement these as quickly as possible. But as I said, there are outstanding challenges and we are working to address those. These issues include the critical issue faced by our local hauliers. While we have a solution to protect ferry routes, the haulage industry is also crucial to effective functioning supply chains. The Department for Economy, who is the lead department, is working closely with my department on this and I continue to press the British Government for this vital support. Due to the current pressures on healthcare professionals, some drivers are having difficulties getting medical assessments where these are needed to renew driving licences. There is an important balance in trying to find a solution to this issue, and that is the issue around road safety. We must at all times ensure that our drivers and road users are kept safe. But I want to assure the committee that I recognise that this is an issue and that we are working hard to find a resolution. Uh, I've asked that we have a two-pronged approach to this, one around practical measures and also a legislative solution. And I hope to be in a position to be able to update the committee and members soon on the progress that we are making. Members will also know that last Thursday I made a written statement on the publication of the independent audit investigation report into the DVA lifts. I also published that report on our website and I shared it with the committee. The findings of that report are important. They make clear that it was appropriate for DVA staff to rely on expert manufacturing opinion, but they also identify some shortcomings. I want to assure you that I have taken all of the independent engineering, procurement and audit advice I received. I recognise that the situation that arose in terms of the lift failures was not confined to here. It did happen in a similar way and with similar consequences in the South and in other parts of Europe too. But that is of no comfort to the thousands of drivers who have been so badly inconvenienced. The committee will be aware of my views on this situation. It was unacceptable. It should never have happened. And I can assure you that new steps and processes will continue to be put in place so it never happens again. While I know this is not on the committee's agenda for today, I and my officials are happy to answer any questions that you might have on the report. I turn to the budget. I know the committee is keen to hear about the 2020-21 budget process. The Finance Minister has announced a 2020-21 resource allocation for the Department of £417.9 million. 
an increase of 33 million against last year's opening budget and a 2021 capital allocation of 558 million pounds which is an increase of 87 million against last year's opening budget although these allocations represent increases compared against the previous financial year as you will have seen from the recent paperwork that we submitted they are not enough to address the significant inherited financial challenges that I face as a minister. In resource terms, my department bid for £57.3 million in pressures going into 2020-2021. Uh, these financial bids are genuine service pressures that, if not met, will create real difficulties for me to deliver and maintain a reasonable level of public services that our citizens deserve. As part of the 33 million increased resource allocation, the Finance Minister has ring fenced 20 million for Translink, which is short of the reoccurring requirement, and only leaves me 13 million pounds to meet all other remaining departmental pressures. Within this challenging context, I am working to finalise allocations from within my resource budget. And you have seen the facts and figures, and it is no secret that will require a number of very difficult decisions. It is fair to say that with the budget available to me, my scope is significantly limited. I don't want to dress that up. However, I am determined to use it to the best possible effect in improving people's lives, improving where they live, keeping them safe on our roads and keeping them connected to communities, jobs and opportunities. Turning to my capital budget, I face an overall pressure of almost £800 million, including further delivery of the A5, A6 and Belfast Transport Hub flagship projects. However, my department has received £558 million. That is a considerable shortfall of over £240 million. These flagship projects are potential game changers in terms of improving connectivity across the north addressing regional imbalance uh, and enhancing our island economy. And I am fully committed and determined to push these forward at pace during my tenure. As the committee will know, I am also committed in ensuring progress in water and wastewater, tackling regional imbalance, uh, north-south connectivity, creating thriving, sustainable living places, and of course, addressing the climate emergency. All of this is even more critical now as we work through the recovery from the COVID-19 crisis. And therein lies my greatest challenge. It's striking the balance between investing and maintaining existing water and wastewater infrastructure, maintaining existing roads and the street lighting network, and then doing what is new and what is needed, encouraging and facilitating modal shift to public transport and sustainable travel, including walking and cycling, which in turn will improve the health and well-being of our citizens and, of course, protect um, the climate. This approach, these decisions, cannot be taken in isolation from the profound impact of COVID-19. That is why I am currently considering very carefully uh, what I need to do in terms of budget allocations. These are not normal times. This is not a normal budget process. The reality is that across every department, the current public health emergency requires a level of response that cannot be contained within conventional budgets or indeed conventional processes. My department is no different. We have identified additional uh, estimated COVID-19 related pressures of up to £181 million. Full details of these have been provided to the committee. These cost estimates are based on the information available and current assumptions on the impact and duration of the crisis, and we are keeping them under constant review. As you will have all read, all of these pressures arise as a result of lost income from various businesses areas, including Northern Ireland Water, TransLink and DBA, and from sources of income such as planning fees and fares on the Strangford Ferry. At this point, I would like to highlight the particular challenges that TransLink faces and I would also like to put on record my thanks and appreciations to all of the staff at TransLink for the positive and important role they are playing in keeping our public transport network open so that we can get our essential workers to and from their places of work. And they are going over and beyond in supporting the health effort. We have already provided the committee with some detail on TransLink's financial cash flow, but the bottom line is that in 2021, and as a direct result of the COVID-19 crisis, and in anticipating losses in sales revenue, 
We are looking at a shortfall of between £91 million and £114 million, depending on the duration of the current restrictions. While my department remains the only department outside of Executive Office not to have received an allocation yet um, from the Department of Finance on the COVID budget, I do welcome the, the, exec or the Executive colleagues' commitments to support and fund our public transport network uh, going forward. And I will continue to make representations to the Finance Minister and to Executive colleagues about the critical importance uh, of infrastructure uh, in terms of growing our economy, delivering for people, but also within the recovery plan from COVID-19. While we continue to do all that we can to protect our communities from COVID-19, we must also keep a watchful eye on the future. Lockdown is difficult, but it has shone a light on the need to do things differently. And we just can't go back to the way things were. We need to move forward and we need to do things better. This requires us to reimagine and reshape our places and our future. And I am committed to building a better future that delivers more for our citizens socially and economically, delivering cleaner, greener and healthy, healthier communities. In the darkness of this pandemic, we are being presented with an opportunity, and it is one that I believe that we should seize. In closing, Chair, I recognise and I appreciate the value that you individually and collectively as a committee place on the critical role of infrastructure in connecting communities, growing our economy, overcoming the COVID crisis and tackling the climate emergency. It is important to fully appreciate that if I am to succeed and make the difference to people's lives, then I am keen to do so. I will need your continued support and constructive challenge to enable me to take those very difficult financial decisions, given the very real competing priorities and limited resources available to me. I hope that this discussion, now within the co context of COVID-19, is another step towards achieving our common goal. I want to thank you for your time this morning, for your support, and Katrina and I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have on any of these important issues. Okay, thank you very much and, and for, for that very full statement, and I'm sure that's probably covered quite a number of areas that the, the committee were looking to, to discuss. Um, so first off, really just to reiterate again our thanks to, to you and the department for the work that you have done during this very, very difficult time. And obviously just to pass on our appreciation to frontline staff, be that across Northern Ireland Water, particularly in TransLink as well, and all, all those who are really on scene um, who are working um, tirelessly just to keep things, things moving on. So very much appreciate the efforts that they make. Um, the committee was more than aware of the very significant challenges that the department faced going into COVID-19. And I suppose really the pressures on TransLink at 20 million at that stage have sort of paled into insignificance with the figures that we're now looking at. As we sit today, does the department have sufficient funds to cover its commitments until the budget process is finalised? No, it doesn't. So this, the discussions then that you're currently having with the finance minister are to what extent? Well, what we needs have to be covered <clears throat> in order to be able to to see us through to that point. Sure. So, uh, as you say, you know, the fact of the situation is prior to COVID nineteen, the department was in a very difficult posi position in terms of its budget. We don't need to rehearse the arguments as to why. Those are the facts. Um, we made genuine bids on genuine pressures, um, and we were made, we were given an allocation that couldn't meet those needs. Um, that has been severely compounded now by COVID-19, and you can see in the dramatic loss of revenue for TransLink, um, DBA, even if we look at Northern Ireland Water, for example, we took the decision to um, defer bills, and that will cost £800,000. Um, the loss in income from Northern Ireland Water is estimated to be around £30 million, so we are in a really difficult position. Um, I've made representations to the Finance Minister, I've shared it with all of the executive, um, and we've been very clear that in those estimated bids, um, they have been robustly challenged. I have challenged officials. I have challenged officials to identify where there is any uh, slippage, where we can find savings, because the finance minister has asked us. I've challenged them on the figures that they're presenting to me, um, and we've provided all of the facts and figures and that analysis to the finance minister. I have to say it was it was it was a bit of a shock to the system to not receive an allocation under the COVID-19 bill. Um, given the critical role of our infrastructure, 
Um, but I do welcome the commitment that we've been given uh, in terms of public transport. The Finance Minister has retained in the centre £95 million for a transport package. Uh, from that will come um, the contribution towards the ferry package. From that will come um, a contribution uh, in terms of airport package, if we can get to that point. And obviously, I said about the importance of our hauliers. Um, I recognise that as key. And again, that is likely to come from that central fund of £95 million. As you know, the £95 million, um, before any of that is taken from it, is insufficient to meet TransLink's needs alone. So I'm in a very difficult um, position, but I continue to provide the analysis to the Finance Minister and to all executive colleagues, and I will continue to press and make the case. In the paperwork, we see that there's a comment where it says, without additional budget cover, Northern Ireland Water will be at risk of being unable to sustain effective health and safety of its staff in line with government gui guidance to protect lives. I mean, that, that's quite a big statement to make. What response have you received from the Department of Finance in relation to the issues surrounding Northern Ireland Water? I thought long and hard about th that sentence being uh, in the paper we're coming through because I realise the severity of that statement, but we have to be uh, always straight up uh, on these matters. Um, we've submitted detail around the bid for Northern Ireland Water. Uh, we're still engaged in a process. To date, we haven't been successful in terms of having an allocation made, but I will continue to press the case and to make it. And you know, As a committee, I'm very grateful for the letter that you provided on the issue of TransLink and would, I'm keen to work with you on this. I recognise that we are in a very difficult financial position. All departments um, are under pressure. I accept that. Um, but what we're saying is that we have a very precarious situation right across the department on key and critical uh, infrastructure and we need to have those resolved. We have stepped as a department over and beyond technically what is our statutory responsibility in terms of trying to rise to the challenge of COVID-19. That's because that's what this department is about. This is actually what infrastructure is about, uh, and we will continue to do that. We have to find ways, I believe, uh, as an executive and departments, of working together, of looking to pool resources and better joined up working. But all I can do at this stage is continue to make the case. Uh, Transport for London made an announcement earlier this week that they were furloughing 7,000 of their staff. Was there any discussion with TransLink in relation to doing something similar? The Finance Minister uh, has written to me and highlighted the fact that um, London has taken this step in furloughing uh, and has suggested would that be applicable to our public transport network. I know on the back of that suggestion it is being explored in terms of fe feasibility by TransLink, but my view on this is very clear. To take the step of furloughing public sector workers is a hugely significant step and it's one that I believe is cross-cutting and should be approached um, and discussed uh, with serious consideration by the executive and in consultation with the trade unions. Okay. Um, moving forward, obviously you've, you've made you've made the comment in relation to economic recovery um, and the challenges that there are, and obviously infrastructure is critical in order to sort of kickstarting that, particularly around um, sort of a couple of projects and in particular sort of our road maintenance and so on as well. Um, in the paperwork, I mean, again, there, today you've indicated that there is a challenge for you in relation to sort of making that work and the decisions that you have to make in and around that. At what stage will you be in a position to announce um, your plans around um, spend? I think that um, it will take me a, a few more weeks. Uh, I want to make sure that I'm making the right decisions, and they're very difficult decisions. And obviously, at this point in time, we don't have any clear understanding of the duration of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, but I do recognise the importance of making announcements as quickly as possible. As I said, the difficulty for me is that I already began with a severely limited budget. As a result of COVID-19, the pressures on that budget have been significantly compounded. And I'm trying to balance up the need, because I've been very honest about saying that People do not have confidence in an executive if their roads are filled with potholes, if their street lighting is not working. Um, so it's about balancing the need to do the basics well, but also the need to start doing things new and trying to push. You'll know I'm very passionate around the agenda of sustainable active travel. Um, so that is what I'm trying to weigh up at the moment. Um, and as soon as I am in a position to be taking decisions, you know, I will absolutely keep the committee updated on it. But as you've said, there is obviously contractual commitments and so on already in place so really the flexibility that you have in and around that is quite limited yes it is and as you've seen of the capital allocation half of it goes to flagship projects 
Um, so there is very limited uh, wriggle room. I've asked officials to explore, is there a degree of flexibility? Because undoubtedly some of the contract work um, and construction work, will, there will be slippage because a lot of them haven't been able to be on site for a while. There are issues around supplies as well. So what I have said to officials is to be constantly scoping to see, do, are there easements in terms of where we can reprofile spending? But obviously I'm committed to the flagship projects that are there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr Hilditch. Thanks, Chair, and you're very welcome, Minister. And we've obviously been following with interest your, your statement over the last few weeks uh, and the work that's been going on within your department and, and others work you work with in relation to transiting and the water and, and that. Um, just on the budget, uh, the allocation for the COVID difficulties there, what was, what was the reason given that your department didn't receive any money, as you're the only department that didn't receive? Was there a reason for that or any explanation sought for that? Uh, I think the response was that £95 million was being held in the centre for a transport fund. Um, when I went back to you know, make further representations, you know, the finance minister was content um, with proposals that I had submitted around making sure that Transink was on a firm financial footing, making sure that Transink was in a position where it could pay its creditors and to pay its staff. And I very much welcome that. I suppose my concern is we know the pressures in Transink alone. We know the pressures in Northern Ireland Water. The transport fund of £95 million, we still are not clear on how much of that will actually come across for TransLink, but we do know that as it stands, it's insufficient to meet its needs. But I do, I, I do believe, uh, and I know, that executive colleagues value the importance of a publicly owned public transport network. Uh, that's not lost in them. I think we need to very quickly move to a position where money is being allocated uh, across. Okay, thank you. And just uh, on the situation we find ourselves in at the minute, you, you'd highlighted some of the work that's going on with the haulage industry and shipping and various things. There. Yeah. But one area of concern that I would have is in relation to the taxi sector. Uh, a lot of difficulties there at the minute in relation to, well, maybe what's not going on. Uh, obviously, we've received some correspondence that are very critical of, of the department at the minute. Basically, well, obviously, they've given the uh, the go ahead to extend the PSV licences. There, there seems to be a mine of other work below that which can't get sorted out at the minute. And that's in relation to potentially uh, access to training and medicals and whatnot and stuff. There's no point in having an extension of the PSVs if you can't even get get that far at the minute. So that would be one area of concern. Uh, others include the lack, the lack of PPE guidance to taxi drivers um, and also finance as well where many of them are finding it very very difficult to uh, just get by at the minute and while there may be money available in June I'm not sure whether you would be aware of the, the Northern Ireland Taxi Act of 2008 where a minister can issue taxi drivers with grant monies and whatnot. So could you have any, some commentary around what's going on with the taxi sector at the moment? Yeah, because it, 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 these are issues that I'm very, very uh, aware of. Um, the Department for Infrastructure is responsible for the regulation of the taxi industry. The COVID crisis has brought into sharp focus a number of regulatory difficulties. The PSV uh, was one. So, as you say, we moved to issue automatic six-month extensions free of charge. The training has been another issue. Um, additional uh, online courses have been provided. Um, and I'm being advised by officials that there should not be difficulties uh, for taxi drivers in being able to access and complete that training online. Um, if that is the case, um, I would like to hear about it. Um, and I know that um, uh, a number of taxi drivers have been contacting my uh, private office and we have been getting back to them to update them on this. Um, this is one of the reasons why, and today I've officially launched it, we have set aside the single point of contact on email for people who are experiencing difficulties. Um, that is the, the dba.customer services. I did share it with members um, at the ad hoc committee. But I would encourage any drivers, taxi drivers who are having difficulty accessing the online training to report it to that and DBA will assist them. On the medicals issue, it is definitely a difficult issue, uh, and it's one that I'm very conscious of, and it's one that we, has taken longer to resolve. Um, and that's why I'm looking at um, a, a pragmatic, practical approach in terms of getting those assessments carried out. In fact, 
I am in a conference call with the BMA tomorrow morning, and we've been engaging with the Department of Health in order to get uh, priority assessments for key workers, of which taxi drivers are one because they are listed uh, as essential workers. So I'm working on that. I'm also uh, exploring a legislative solution specifically for taxis on the uh, medical license because separate legislation applies to them. On the issue of um, grants, I've taken specific legal advice on this issue. There is provision for a grant in the legislation, but the grant uh, has never been enacted before, but it is for regulatory purposes. It cannot be used as a hardship fund for taxi drivers. Um, if you were to ask um, executive colleagues um, about the issues that I write prolifically on to them, uh, outside of medical questions on um, testing, tracing, PPE and so forth, the second issue is taxi drivers. And um, I understand that their livelihoods have been hit incredibly hard. But unfortunately, I don't have the remit to be given financial hardship to um, employers or to people you know, who are struggling. I would love to be in a position to be able to do so. It's not. It's for the Department for Economy and the Department for Finance. I've also, the Department for Economy is also the lead department in terms of guidance um, for those who are essential workers. And I have been in correspondence with the Department for Economy urging the department to issue very specific guidance to taxi drivers because there are particular challenges around social distancing. I will continue um, to do that. Um, outside of the financial assistance, um, you know, which would be a matter for the Department for Economy and the Department for Finance. There's also the opportunities around redeployment and repurposing of the taxi industry. And I've been in correspondence with the Minister for Communities on that as the lead department. So I've also issued open letters to the taxi industry. I absolutely recognise. I think it is important that um, it's clear where responsibility for different issues lie. And what I would hope people would say is that on the regulatory side, we have been working very hard to try to address those issues. And I've also been pressing executive colleagues because I recognise that there are wider difficulties being experienced by the industry beyond the regulatory side, and I will continue to do that. Yeah, there's, there's definitely operations going on out there within the community that you might have expected taxi drivers to have been involved in, and they haven't been, which maybe some of them should push on at. You know. I think you would admit that a ta taxi driver, it, it, Quite a difficult situation. Most people are known workers at the I end know. of the day. They, they work okay for a depot, but they go out and that's the, they're really on their own. They're probably self employed as well and whatnot. So it's just the whole sort of mental health thing that's going to kick in in that sector in particular because there is a lot of people very down at the moment in relation to what, what, what's going on there, you know? No, I, and I absolutely get that. You know, um, we all know taxi drivers, many of us have them in our family, and they've been one of the group that's been absolutely hardest hit um, by this crisis. I absolutely accept that. And just to reassure you uh, and members and the taxi industry, I will work hard to resolve the, the medical issues, which is the one outstanding issue. If there are other regulatory difficulties, I will do what I can to resolve them with officials, and I will continue to work with executive colleagues on the wider issues around what we can do collectively as an executive to try to assist them. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Boylan. Thanks, Chair, and thank the Minister for her answers so far. And I appreciate we've submitted a number of questions to the Department, over 30, I think. 48. Yes. It's been blazing to my mind. I, I appreciate the responses, but I just want to go back, and I mean, I, I want to touch on the tax issue, but in terms of, you, you did say about reduced pressures and weren't identified uh, in relation to budgetary pressures. Was that after a comprehensive review? Of the department itself, just I want to ask that, that question. Yeah. Yep. Um, there was a comp comprehensive review undertaken, and the officials can go into the specifics. Yeah, and just to pick up on that, one of the things there, there's two distinctions that the minister has already made: one in the resource budget, and one in relation to the capital budget. Um, and as the minister has said, on the capital budget. We are looking to see what are the impacts in the construction sector, what projects are slowing down and what opportunity that gives to do the sort of repurposing projects that the Minister has talked about. On the resource side, um, the nature of those costs is such that they really are very hard to change. So most of our costs, whether it's in TransLink or in the department itself, are people related. Most of those people are still coming if not to work every day, they're either working at home or else we need them to be out doing essential jobs. So those costs still continue to be incurred and that presents real difficulties for us. 
we have quite a, compared to other departments, Cahal, that I've worked in, we have actually, the Minister has very little <laughs> discretionary scope when it comes to the resource budgets because of the pressures she's just highlighted. So the folk we need on the ground to be keeping the roads safe, to be keeping the buses running for essential workers, to be keeping our flood defences ready because the last thing we need is you know, the wrong response to a different emergency. Um, all of those continue to incur the same costs. So the scope actually to say we're not doing any of that has become really limited. So one of the things the Minister has been really clear on has been the have you been absolutely sure that there is nothing sitting here that at this time it would be appropriate to stop? Actually, in many ways, the reverse is true because we are finding new challenges that we have to respond to within a budget that I am very satisfied is paired back closer to the, the, you know, the bone than, than you would normally like to be able to do more things. No, and I appreciate that. And it was remiss of me to, to, to uh, recognise the work of the oh, staff okay. in the department and also I know that you'd said that the ad hoc committee there were some people who took ill and mm -hmm. hope they recover and everyone's well. Thank you. Um, and, and just on that, I mean, obviously I know that you in terms of transferring the capital and resource, you cannot do that. Oh. I'm, I'm just wondering, th there's no capital out there. You, you've looked at that to say, well, if, there's, if there is pressure, that's all discussed and there's nothing there that you can transfer over to address the COVID because I know we're discussing COVID and budget. I know, but you can't separate them. No, 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 and that's what I'm saying. I don't want to separate them out. I'm just, I'm just we're, we're, we're fighting the COVID at the minute and we're doing our best to combat it. Absolutely. I'm just wondering, um, just in relation to the capital, there's nothing there that you... Yeah, we aren't um, at departmental level allowed in any circumstances to switch capital into resource. Um, it's right. no doubt a discussion that the executive may well have with Treasury, but those levers aren't available to us. And one of the difficulties is that it creates problems in the long term. As you transfer it to resource, it starts to pay for costs that don't stop, and then it's really difficult to switch no, it back no, no, off again. But you're absolutely right. Um, there, the Minister's point that she's made around the capital budget, there, there could be an opportunity to do more with money that mightn't be available for other purposes, but actually so much of the Minister's capital budget is already committed to flagships, and we're already underspending on things like structural maintenance of our road network, where we should be spending about 140 odd million a year, and yeah. last year was probably one of our better years at 75, and you, know, you can do the maths yourselves, you know that that just stacks up more costs in the longer term. No, no I appreciate that. And, uh, Hopefully, at the end of this process, whenever that may be, I mean, I'm sure the committee will collectively support some of the bids and, and work with the minister in trying to trying to address some of those those bigger issues. Just I want to come back to the taxes because all of us, obviously, as, as MLAs, have been, have been lobbied. Um, minister, in, in light of what the answers you've given, would you consider? And I mean, I've, I've heard about the CPC and I've heard about the medical assessments and, um, and the grants issue. Is there an opportunity to introduce emergency legislation to address? Those issues, or is it just on the grant? Yeah, even the grant. Could, could we look again at the, the act and see if we could bring something forward to extend that? I think that yeah, and, and we have looked at this very closely. And, and the grant is for regulatory purposes. I think what would really help the taxi industry is financial assistance, yeah. given the impact on their livelihood. You know, but obviously, you know, if committee want to make representations to the economy minister or the finance minister on this on this matter I, you know i would encourage you to do that and um, i have scrutinized uh, the grant aspect obviously um you know wherever we can whatever i can do to help the taxi industry i, I will continue to do uh, and that's why when i was made aware of the grant uh, we actually did take the legal advice but it's very clear that it is for regulatory purposes and what the taxi industry needs at this time which has been provided to a number of different people whose livelihoods have been decimated by this the crisis is financial support and a package on that level. And just on the medical, I know that there's some key workers like HCVs, drivers who are key workers and they're waiting on medical assessments too. So I mean, I may I may write well, that right in the Please do statement. because, um, as I said, we have had um, we've been engaged with the Department of Health. Um, we are putting measures in place to ensure that key workers um, are being prioritised for medical assessments. Obviously, uh, up to this point, there's been huge pressures on all of our medics uh, in terms of focusing on COVID-19. Um, there is um, an agreement now that there will be this prioritisation. Um, so if you're aware of people who are being prohibited from carrying out their essential work because they haven't been able to get 
um, a medical assessment, if you could flag it up to me, okay. um, I will take a personal look into it. Okay, and just, just two final points. In terms of the logistics, and we know the work that they're doing out there in terms of providing the food and the service and everything else, I'm just wondering, you had said at the ad hoc that you were engaged with the British government in terms of support for that, in terms of, and also, um, where has that engagement been now in support for the logistics sector? And also, um, I'm aware that in the south, particularly oxygen is, is supply provided through to Dublin. Yes. I mean, what conversations have you had with the south in relation to that matter as well? So on the Holliers yes. issue, um, I'm in very regular communication with the um, Department for Transport, very regular um, with both Grant Chaps and also with Rachel McLean. Also in very close contact with the Northern Ireland Secretary of State on this issue. Um, we've been engaging through Treasury. I actually had the opportunity to directly raise the issue of ferries and Holliers with the Chancellor um, on one of the wider uh, conference calls and made it very clear that we have a very unique set of circumstances here as an island. We are wholly reliant uh, on our ports and our holliers for getting critical supplies to us. Um, I think that uh, you know there is an issue around Treasury perhaps want more detail on how you evidence that and we're working very hard with the industry to try to do that. Um, so I will continue to make the case and depress the need for it. Um, and to work with the economy minister and also the dairy minister uh, as well on this, because this issue runs right across the executive. It, it's a critical issue. So I will continue to do that and to provide all of the evidence and representations that are required. On the oxygen issue, we have been assured by the Department of Health that we have enough supply currently uh, of oxygen. Um, I'm very clear, though, that making sure that our ports stay open, making sure that our ferries are still operable with our hauliers is key. And I've been very clear as well as in saying that oxygen is on that list of critical supplies. I've had regular communication with um, Minister Ross in the South on this issue, um, and also with um, colleagues in Scotland and Wales, because this is an issue that affects all of us. And I will continue to work with everyone that I can to try to see this addressed. And just finally, to you, Chair, the issue of you said in a statement recently about an um, ambitious recovery plan. Yeah. And you mentioned active travel, which yeah. we, we're, we're keen on that. Just would you like to give us a wee view on that and, and future proving on the post COVID issues that or any, any plans or any ideas? Would you like to yeah. expand a wee bit on that, please? So I think what the COVID crisis has shown us is that we need to get back to having a very people centred approach. Um, and we need to realise that infrastructure, public health, education, the environment are all inextricably linked. Um, I think what this has done has brought into sharp focus the need to create spaces and reimagine them. Um, and I am very keen to try to do that. I'm actually um, having a active travel sector Zoom call. These things have become uh, quite wordy, but with the sector as well um, next week, um, because they have some great ideas around quick wins, early interventions, and I'm very keen to push that. Um, I just think if we don't do things differently, then we will have wasted the opportunity that's presented before us. Um, we need to be looking at things like widening footpaths. It's not just me saying that. The Chief Medical Officer actually said that recently uh, at a meeting about the need to have widened footpaths if we are to socially distant, which we will have to do for a considerable period of time. I'm looking at issues around, say, uh, traffic lighting. Can we make that? Uh, more conducive for walkers. Uh, I'm looking at the possibility of uh, pop-up cycle uh, spaces, pop-up walk spaces, and I'm very, I'm keeping a very close eye on what's happening down south, what's happening across in Scotland, where there was an announcement just yesterday, what's happening around the world. Um, and I think that this is a, is a real exciting agenda that has multiple benefits to health, to um, public spacing, to the environment. And it's something that I want to work on with executive colleagues and with local government as well. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Muir. Thank you very much. Um, just to clarify the record, I was previously an employee of TransLink, and so a councillor in Ards and North Down for a council. Um, I'd like to thank the Minister for the officials coming here today and also for the timeliness of the responses. Every time anything's raised with the department, there's a, a prompt response, and I really um, do appreciate that. I think the update around logistics is important. Um, that package, alongside the airports, really needs to be delivered ASAP, and this may be an update in relation to the situation in relation to the airports and whereabouts we are in relation to getting that over the line. Also, last Thursday, 
the report came out in relation to the MOT situation. In any normal times, I would probably would have got a, a greater airing and consideration by the committee. It's just really, as we're continuing to issue temporary exemption certificates, how much longer is that tenable to be doing that, and whether we would be considering moving MOTs to a, a two-yearly basis, um, because. I think the bureaucratic issues around the issue in the TECs and maybe the timescales ahead and the likelihood of us being able to have MOT centres opened in the next number of months is probably making that we're going to have to make a decision in relation to that. I've got a couple of other questions, but maybe that's just the first two. Okay. Um, thank you. On the airports, um, the executive has put forward a very robust case on the need to maintain our connectivity and also the importance of airports um, for our supply chain. Um, all that detail has been provided to the Department for Transport. The Department for Transport, I have to say, recognises the importance of this. The Secretary of State absolutely recognises the importance of it. Uh, and all of the details have been submitted across to Treasury. Um, discussions are still ongoing, but I would be hopeful that we can get to a point soon where something um, could be announced. And again, it's another area where there's been very um, positive cooperation between departments. Uh, so from my department through to Minister Murphy's through to Minister Dodd's, uh, we've worked very hard, officials uh, and as ministers, on it. So I would be hopeful that we can get to a positive pace soon. Um, on the MOT um, situation, uh, in terms of the TECs, if someone is coming to a point where their TEC is about to expire, they will be issued with the new one. I think what has been frustrating in this process it has been um, that we could have had a more automated situation. The fact that you're advising people to phone up to book an appointment that is never going to happen in order to trigger a TEC is frustrating for people, and I accept that. And the department has been doing a lot of work around automation, and I would hope that in the not to distant future, so as soon as possible, we, we will be in a position to update members on that. But there is a significant piece of work going on to put all of that and make it automated so people do not have to make uh, appointments and go through that rigmarole, if you like. On the biennial testing, I always get the pronunciation of that wrong, two year testing every two years. Um, it is something that I'm still actively considering. I think that it has um, a number of, of benefits. Um, so it's something that I am currently exploring, and I think the fact that we have found ourselves um, in the situation means that we have been issuing TECs. So we have, without intention, if you like, been in a position where some people might, at the end of this, have gone two years without a an MOT. Um, so it is something that I'm still very actively considering. I have to make the point, though, that it's really important that we all individually and collectively remind road users that they are responsible for the safety of their vehicle on the road. Um, it's not just a matter of making sure that your car is safe on the road when it comes to your date of your MOT test. We have a duty to make sure it's safe uh, every single day of the week. Um, focus has been on COVID-19 and how we respond to that, but I hope to be bringing forward further information to the committee and to take the committee's mind um, on a move to testing every two years. Uh, just, just in relation to the point that uh, Cattle Boylan raised in relation to active travel and sustainable travel, I think the stuff you're looking at in terms of for example, widening the pavements so they allow social distancing, which is going to be with us for a significant period of time, and also looking at expanding uh, cycle lanes is really important because the future has to be better than the past. And I think maybe we have your view in relation to the capital plan you inherited and whether there's going to be potential reprofiling of that because it's very road heavy. Um, the other side of that is that um, the Scottish Government issued advice yesterday in relation to wearing face masks, uh, masks on public transport and whether that's something that you would be considering issuing guidance on, because obviously we have to take into account public health guidance in relation to this. Uh, and the last one is really a budgetary question. There obviously was a bid for additional monies as a result of COVID-19. Uh, one of those was in relation to the futures uh, of TransLink. And it's just what basis upon that has been made in terms of us being able to ease out of the restrictions and move back to you know, passenger levels pre crisis because uh, there is obviously a worry that it might take a longer time to encourage more people to use public transport and it's about what the basis of that budget estimate was done and what work will be done to try to ensure that in the future we're actually a much more sustainable society. Okay. Um, so on the um, active sustainable um, travel, um, there is, I've asked officials to look to see in terms of easements or flexibilities how we can progress that because it's a ministerial priority. Um, 
So uh, they're currently looking at how to do that. As I said, we're also looking at what places around the world are, are doing. And I've asked for um, that to be broken down into things that we can do very early on at minimal cost, what we can do as a longer term approach. But also, I'm very clear that as we need a clear policy shift in my department. Um, because we need to, when we are examining any new scheme, we need to be looking to see how does it promote active, sustainable travel, as well as what it does for, um, for vehicles on the road. Um, you know, I've said since I took up post, I'm not the Minister for Roads. I don't mean to say to be um, derogatory in any way, because I absolutely recognise the importance of roads and connectivity, particularly if we look at areas uh, in the North West. But I think that first and foremost in our minds, when we're looking at brand new schemes and the design of those schemes, we need to be asking what, are, what is this scheme, how is this scheme promoting sustainable active travel? So I'm very clear that what I would like to be able to do is to have a number of early quick wins. I think we have momentum and we have, it's imperative now because of COVID-19. Take a longer term approach in terms of the, the interventions. But I think clearly we need to have a different policy and legislative approach to these matters as well. On face masks, it's an issue that's being discussed at the executive. Uh, I noted the, the um, uh, advice coming from the Scottish Government. Um, and as executive, this is something that we're keeping under active consideration. And I think the health minister made reference to it at the press conference um, yesterday. I'm very clear that on the issue of PPE for staff, there can be no compromise. I've made it very clear that where workers in my department have to go out to carry out essential works, where those works are being carried out um, by contractors on behalf of the department, absolutely we need to make sure that measures are in place to keep those workers safe and they must be given the proper PPE. Um, and we will continue to make sure that that is the case. It's very important for me. The number one priority here is to keep people, my staff, those who are working for the department and the public safe. On the social distancing and or the Translink issue, um, we keep under constant review the service and timetable. Um, the challenge will be that we must adhere to social distancing. It will be with us for a long time. So that will mean maintenance of the current policy around 50% admission of passengers. That means that as people start to come back to work, we will need to have much more fleet uh, on the road, so we are constantly keeping the situation under review. But I think the biggest challenge will be around public confidence. You know, it makes better sense for <coughs> the environment for as many people as possible if they have to travel to use public uh, transport. But I think the big, big issue will be around how we give people the confidence to start using our public transport again. It's something that I'm very mindful of, and already looking with TransLink uh, at what we need to do to um, to give people that confidence. The figures are based upon, in terms of the easing of the restrictions, is there a time scale for that in terms of the basis? At, at the moment, there is no set timetable because obviously the executive will review again on the 9th of May the regulations. So what we are doing is to keep it under constant, re constant review and to move in line with that. What we have said, though, is if we do see an increase, I gave this commitment that if there is a, a bus service or a train service and the number of passengers required to get on that for essential travel um, doesn't, it doesn't allow us to maintain the 50% passenger capacity, then we will put on additional fleet. So there is that flexibility and additional capacity sitting there if it is required. But we will be led by the executive in terms of relaxations, recovery and also always in line with the public health advice. Yeah, thank you. Ms Anderson. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister, for, for your statement. Sorry, I'm over here at no, the, <laughs> behind you, but uh, it's just the way we are at the moment. Um, I'm very conscious that, that you're aware, and I think all of the, the ministers are aware of the implications that austerity has had on their departments, and you know the, the damage that it's done to public service is quite clear for all to see. I just hope that when we come out of this pandemic that we never again return to days like that. Um, however, I'm not confident that we won't. Um, so I was glad to hear your own comments about the kind of society that, that we need to have uh, going forward. And you said the, the same in the, in the chamber. And I would absolutely um, concur with that. I'm conscious of TransLink that you had to dig, dig into your reserves, reserves that were needed for now, for this time. And you were having to do that before this pandemic hit. You know, it is outrageous 
uh, to say the least. So I just want to comment on that. You made a comment around your um, your interest in in advancing and in um, tackling regional disparities as the Sinn Féin spokesperson. Uh, in the north for tackling regional disparities. It's something that I wouldn't mind engaging further with you on. And if you could give an update, even briefly or even return to me in writing, just around the time frame for the A5A6, because I'm, I'm assuming that both of those time frames have been affected uh, by COVID. COVID. Mm -hmm. You talked about NA water. And one of the issues I'm, that I'm very concerned about is around fly tipping at reservoirs. You know, we had we had issues with we've seen pictures uh, this week of different reservoirs, and I'm sure, like ourselves, that you're very concerned about that. And given that we're telling more and more people, more and more people are thankfully washing their hands, and people have been fantastic uh, staying in uh, for the vast majority of them and washing their hands. But I am also noticing as I was travelling here today, there's more traffic on the road uh, this week than there was last week, and there was more last week than there was the week before. So I am concerned that there's a little bit of complacency uh, creeping in. But when we were talking about NI water, and I raised this with you last week in the, in the chamber about PPE, and you were able to reassure us um, with regards to the volume that you had and for the workers, and I was glad to hear you repeat that, that you do not want to and will not subject uh, people that are working for your department or uh, in your department to, to any particular danger. But I'm, I'm wondering how this works, because say, for instance, yesterday I was with Northwest Care, a domiciliary care facility that I personally have had uh, contact with and know the value of those who work in it, who cared for my mummy uh, when she was alive and at home with us. And they're telling me that they have received information from the trust as, as of yesterday, that they're only going to receive 50% of their PPE this week. And I'm wondering, is this having a widespread effect across all of the departments? Because for domiciliary care workers that are bathing, nursing, and caring for the most vulnerable in our society, how can you tell them? How can we even countenance only only um, given sort of um, a care facility like that, 50 percent? The issue of um, drivers, and I appreciate the fact that you have corresponded with me yesterday uh, with regards to how you've been able to provide those, for instance, who use public service now, particularly those in the health service, frontline workers, uh, free public service. I'm also conscious that there have been a number of people who were just at the point of trying to get a driving test in order for them to carry out a function to service um, particularly those on the front line, and they haven't been able to, you know, driving tests now is impossible near enough uh, because of the restrictions and limitations because the, the driver the, it needs to be beside those carrying out the test. So it is about trying to find a way to extend that to other front line workers. And I'm very conscious what you said, you don't want to open this up to others that uh, may fail of this who aren't essential front line workers, but there are more front line workers than what's been been able to be captured, so I just want to bring that up to you again. You mentioned that uh, finally two things you say is that you're constantly in contact uh, with the executive on a number of fronts, and one of them you says about test and tracing and isolation. I'm wondering, did you write to or get a re reaction from or an explanation from even the, your, your colleague, the health minister, because we haven't been able to do that. I say we collectively in the assembly have asked on a number of occasions, and I know it's been asked in the in, at meetings, committee meetings with them, why? Why was on the 15th of March community testing stop? No, I, I just cannot get a handle into the rationale as to why that was. So it's just, it's, I mean, because it affects and community testing would affect people that work for you. When you talked about the taxis, just finally, Chair, when you talked about the grants for taxis only for regulation, it's just from my understanding, I could be reading this wrong, because it's not clear when you read that section of the Taxi Act. And like everyone else, I'm deeply concerned about taxi drivers at this moment in time who are struggling to make ends meet, because it says under Schedule 1 that the Department may, with the approval of the Department of Finance, pay grants to such persons or bodies as it is considered appropriate in connection with any other provision or purpose of this Act, and that's a Taxi Act. So I'm just trying to get a handle on that in relation to what you said about it being regulation. And thank you, Chair, for allowing me time to ask all these questions. Um, on the A5 and the A6, there will be an element of slippage. We're yeah. actually trying to ascertain the degree. Um, and obviously, um, workers 
who are working on those projects need to be able to do so uh, safely. So it's something that I'm very conscious of. On fly tipping, you're absolutely right. It is an issue. In fact, Northern Ireland Water uh, and our department were very proactive last week in trying yeah. to send a message to members of the public uh, not to do this because it, it should never be uh, acceptable. Mm. But during this crisis, you know, it's beyond reproach. So we've been very, sending very strong messages and would welcome support from members in the committee on that. Um, on the issue of PPE, this is an issue that I take very seriously. In fact, I've requested weekly updates from my department on the levels and stock of PPE. You are right, there is a global issue in terms of supply. Um, but I am keeping a very, very close eye on this situation because of the importance of it. I'm also in contact with TransLink uh, and Northern Ireland Water about their own PPE situation. Uh, in <coughs> fact, I've requested a conference call with the Chief Executive of Northern Ireland Water uh, because we are in regular communication, and that is one of the issues that I will be discussing with her. Um, on the issue of driving tests, you're absolutely right. I recognise the difficulty of it. The challenge, though, is how you maintain social distancing when you're sitting side by side with someone in a vehicle. This always comes down to the balance of trying to minimise disruption uh, to customers and to people, but also keeping them safe and keeping driving instructors safe. Um, and we have to do that in line yeah. with the, the guidance. Um, on the issue of uh, public transport and extending the free travel, um, I am very sympathetic to that. I, I suppose my difficulty is that um, we have frontline workers in both the public sector and the private sector doing <coughs> valuable work. For the successful practical operation of that scheme, you would have to offer just free public transport. You couldn't say, sorry, do you work in a shop? You need to show me your credentials. Do you work uh, in a benefits office? You need to show me your credentials. Uh, so that's why um, I have to think about the unintended consequences. Mm. You said yourself that we are growing concerned about compliance. I would be concerned that in doing something, um, which I believe there is merit in doing, it would have the unintended consequence of encouraging more people to get on public transport and therefore would be counterproductive to what we're trying to do to stop the spread uh, of the virus. But as I've said, yeah. I am keeping the situation under constant review with executive colleagues. On the grants issue, I can let yeah. Katrina pick up the detail. But as it says, uh, it's in relation to the provisions of the Act. The Taxi Act is about the regulation of the taxi industry. I think that's where it is. But can, Katrina okay. can pick up on the on the detail. And on the Health Minister, I think it would be better for the for the Health Minister mm -hmm. to answer it's your questions. It's just that she says you were writing to them on that issue, and that's yeah. why I took the opportunity to ask you. <clears throat> yeah, just um, to add to what the Minister said, um, we've taken very specific legal advice um, on the provisions of section 55 of the Taxis Act. The key thing is it cannot be read in isolation. I mean, like, like all legislation, it's read within the context within which it's set. Um, that section of the Act deals specifically with regulation, so it would provide an opportunity if it were commenced in certain regulatory circumstances, but as the Minister previously said, and as we have tested to destruction with our legal advisor, it is not a general provision, it is only a provision in relation to regulation. So a simple example might be if we required some change to the regulatory machinery, like you know, meters or something like that, it may be the sort of circumstances where you could contribute to the costs of a regulatory change, but it can't be used for wider purposes. Um, and just to assure the member that we have, the, yes. the minister has asked very many questions to make sure that she is satisfied and I've done the same, that we're not missing something. So that's not going to be applicable at this time. The no. grants, the paying of the grants as stated no. here doesn't as actually the apply said, for the, 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 the income more support. The route really is the fact that taxis are such a key business sector. Yeah. Um, in our economy and it's how to make sure that their their contribution to our wider economic development is recognised through mm -hmm. the packages already available. Okay, thank you. Okay. Ms Kimmins. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister, for, for your um, statement today. Just a couple of questions, and I suppose some of them will lead on to some of the questions I've already asked. Um, and I know you've, you've answered there around PPE, I suppose, and it's a question I'd, I'd submitted um, by email as well. Um, in relation to the protection of workers in, in all um, areas within the department. In terms, you said there you're getting weekly updates um, around PPE, and it's just really to see, you know, are we getting assurances that everyone who needs it has access to it? Um, I had given a, a particular example where a worker from within the department um, in the roads maintenance end of things had, had queried around essential work, and, and it's really to determine how are we, you know, 
how are we clarifying for, for those areas what is deemed as essential work at this time? Um, there was, um, it was explained to me that they were working on a skeleton basis, and now I suppose they feel that they're maybe being pushed to do more work, which it's not clear whether it's being, it is deemed as essential or not. So it's just about how is that filtering down through um, the various departments within within <coughs> infrastructure and, and making sure that all workers are protected in, in all um, all that they do, and they're not being asked to do work that's that's over and above at this time. Um, the second one, I suppose, and a number of members have raised this at the ad hoc committee as well, and I as well had, had asked around planning. And I know you'd said that um, we um, the people whose planning is about to expire um, can apply for renewals. I suppose, do we have an idea of how many um, applications are are at that stage? I know it's it's a rolling process, but. I you know I just have an example of a constituent that's contacted us and theirs is due to expire next week, um, and obviously they were keen to to start work, but with with the current restrictions, um, they can't. Um, but I I would fear that with with a plan for renewal, there's an, there's a chance that an application could fall for for whatever reason due to no fault of of the applicant, um, and also I suppose around. Um, creating a, a a bigger workload for planning department staff. Um, which I know in my own area, there's there's already um, you know their their past capacity there, um, and is there any any um, progress on even looking at the the way in Scotland they've progressed the legislation to um, and in the south for ex extensions, you know, and I look at the, I know. All of this isn't uh, as straightforward as it might seem sometimes, but I know, like how we've done it with the MOTs, you know, something to that effect would probably be, um, yeah. would, you know, if it, it could maybe be more streamlined than, than people having to go and apply for renewals. Um, just a couple of other things that have been raised with me that, um, in terms of projects, and I know my colleague there mentioned things like the F5 and the A6 and my own area of the Southern Relief Road, and there's few concerns raised me from the public there in terms of how public consultations and things would be carried out. Obviously, we don't want to slow up progress, and there's, there are things that are unavoidable, but um, can we get assurances that any public engagement will ensure that everyone will have an opportunity to um, to engage with that, whether or not they have good internet access or you know that it's not just based on that, um, because we want to make sure that we have genuine and effective engagement there as part of that consultation process without <coughs> delaying things. Um, and the last question I have just, and I suppose it, it, it ties in with some of the, the free uh, public transport as well, is an issue being raised with us around key worker driving tests, and obviously the driving tests are unable to be carried out. Is there anything that, that the department is looking at that might help with that situation? Because I know if key workers are who maybe because of the nature of, of where we're at at the minute have to move around more and, and are required to be more mobile, yep. but require a driving te their driving tests, and this has been put in hold. So, sure. um, thank you. Okay. Um, in terms of the um, uh, PPE around um, staff, um, I am advised that we have sufficient levels of PPE uh, for workers in line with um, the health guidance, um, and that's why I've said to officials that I want to keep very much over this issue and to be kept fully updated. And I'm also saying to members that if you are aware of concerns and we got back to you, you know, we need to be, I need to be hearing about it. Um, we're also in very close contact with contractors as well to make sure that they are doing what is required to keep um, uh, staff safe. O on the issues of essential works, uh, I suppose the issue is that when you look at the face of some of these things, like cleaning gullies, um, you ask yourself, how is that ever deemed to be essential? But it actually is essential in terms of flood prevention. Uh, and I think there's maybe a communication issue um, for me as a department to you know, be, put, be given an explanation as to why things are deemed to be essential when on the face of it it looks to be routine. Um, on the issue of planning permissions, um, following the ad hoc committee, um, I actually went back again to ask officials, are they absolutely sure that um, extending expiry timetables requires primary legislation. Uh, they are adamant that it is. Um, that is why we have said in the current set of circumstances, um, the best option is to either renew, and I know that that is not ideal, uh, or to commence works, and I know that that is not ideal in the, in the current set of circumstances. We had thought that there would be a possibility of an executive-wide coronavirus bill. 
And what we could have done was put that piece of um, legislation package within that bill. I I'm not sure now that that piece of wider legislation is going to come forward, so I am considering primary legislation from within the department. I think the difficulty, though, is the time that that will take and what kind of a solution does that provide for your constituents and others who are facing that difficulty at, at this moment in time. On the issue of, um, can't even read my own writing. Oh yes, pu uh, public consultation. Um, I was very clear on this, that when we were removing the face-to-face -face public consultation to adhere with guidance, that we needed to maintain uh, community consultation. It's a critical part. And I was also clear that it needed to um, be carried out in a way to engage those who don't have access to the internet, for example. So detailed guidance will issue on Friday, okay. and it will include issues like um, safe leaflet drops. It will include guidance like telephone consultation, because I'm very keen that no one should be excluded from this process. It's still a critical part. We just need to do it in a creative and inclusive way. Um, and there's an expectation uh, on applicants uh, and on councils that this will be carried out. On the issue of driving tests, um, it, as I said, the issue, the challenge there is around social distancing, and I have been looking at the South, I've been looking at GB, I've been looking to see has anywhere else actually cracked this difficulty, and unfortunately to date they haven't, but I am aware of it, I'm keeping it under review, and it was one of the considerations uh, in terms of the decision to extend the free travel to, to frontline healthcare workers. Um, but because of the public guidance, I am limited in trying to find the resolution to the specific driving test issue. On the issue of theory tests, though, I know that that's an issue for some people. I'm very conscious of that. We are exploring the possibility of being able to extend that uh, to the point where um, you know, an extension would be possible until we resume the practical and theory tests. So just to assure members, we are constantly scanning the horizon for the difficulties. We are trying to find solutions, but we will be restricted by the priority of keeping people safe. Is that weighing up that balance? Can I, can I just come just, back? I'm just question. conscious of the minister's time because Sorry. she has overrun uh -huh. the time that she had indicated to us. We've got two other members. If you're content that we move on and if okay, follow sure. up in okay. writing, okay. would that be Fine, okay? Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Beggs. Yeah, thank you, Minister, for your opening statement on the clarity with the challenges that there are ahead. Uh, and particularly, you've indicated that there's insufficient resources to reach the normal next stage in the budget process as, as when additional funds would be allocated. Um, that must be of concern to everyone. And in particular, uh, we have TransLink and Northern Iron Water who are set up under company law and their directors have a requirement to ensure solvency. So my question is, how can you allay my concerns that decisions will be taken either by yourself or the executive, additional resources, policy changes, whatever is needed? So that uh, uh, if there needs to be a conserving of funds, so that we will not help hit such a, a catastrophic situation that company law will kick in. That's my first question. MOTs, uh, the original group of people who were given extensions to, was to do with faulty lamp, ramps. Their four month period is coming to an end. You've said they'll be extended. For clarity, do those individuals have to reapply? or will they be automatically posted out a second extension? Uh, there, there's a lack of clarity around that one. And then finally, in terms of um, capital going forward, what sort of money do you think is needed to widen footpaths? I mean, it's, if you look at individual ones, it's not too bad, but if you're doing every one, it is a huge amount of money. And have you considered, finally, reprofiling, rescheduling some of the flagship projects, which may no longer be the priority, which we all have. I'm not saying stop them. I'm looking at reprofiling, rescheduling. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I, I share your concerns for TransLink and Northern Ireland Water. As I said, I have secured a commitment from the executive that it will put TransLink on a firm financial footing. Um, there are growing pressures on Northern Ireland Water. Um, the executive recognises the critical importance of our wastewater uh, infrastructure. Uh, we're not going to be able to build homes if we don't invest. Uh, we're not going to be able to grow our economy. Uh, and this is a critical issue about the provision of clean drinking water, safe drinking water to people's homes, uh, safe treatment of our wastewater, and then being able to have a network and capacity that allows us to grow and have all the ambition that we have. I don't think that point is lost on the executive. I'm not at a point yet where an allocation you know, has been made. But I know that everybody from across all parties recognise the importance of it, and I believe that that is also recognised uh, in the executive. 
Um, on the issue of the TEC extension, you're absolutely right. The first cohort, um, theirs will be uh, coming up soon. Uh, I've recently signed off on a submission for a further extension to their TECs, but the difficulty is, as you point out, at this moment in time, even though we're doing a lot of work around automation, we're not at that point yet, so I don't want to give out mixed messages. So what people need to do is they need to phone up and book that appointment to trigger the second TEC. I hope to be in a place soon where we have it automated and people will not need to do that, but at this moment in time, that is the, the process that they have to follow. Even those that, that originally applied and haven't had their yes. money refunded, do they have to pay a second batch of funding? Yes. When do they get refunded the original application? No, they will have got their original um, application refunded. Right. There has been a delay because of the volume and obviously the, the pressures on staff because staff um, you know, are working from home or you know, so there, there's difficulties on that. So yes, I'm not going to make excuses about this. It is far from perfect, um, but what we're trying to do is to work through that. And we need people to have the TEC triggered under the current system. They need to phone up to book the appointment. That's why we put considerable focus on trying to get to a place of automation. And I'm hopeful that in a short space of time, I'll be able to make announcements around that. But at this moment in time, for people to get the TEC or the extended TEC, they need to phone up, book the appointment. Um, and also they can check online, because I know that's a concern for people because of delays in receiving the hard copy by post. I would encourage people to check online because we have a system where you can find your registration and see if you've been issued with the TEC. On widening the footpaths, we're not going to be able to widen every single footpath. There's going to have to be, um, we're going to have to look at it through a framework. I've noticed in other countries what they're doing is they are having a, a priority matrix where they're looking at footpaths for people to get to shops and get to other critical services. Um, and so that's why I've asked officials to go and do a lot of the work around uh, what has happened in other places, the costs of it. But widening footpaths is not um, a department for infrastructure alone issue. It is a public health issue now that we're in a world where social distancing is the new norm. In terms of <coughs> flagship projects, I hear what you are saying. Um, I am committed, because they are flagship projects, to progressing them. Even though it's not the priority at this moment in time? There's a commitment because they're flagship projects. It's an executive commitment that I have to honour. <laughs> Bananas. OK. Thank you, Ms Kelly. Um, thanks very much, and thanks, Minister. Could I just say uh, well done to your department's officials and yourself in the innovative and creative way in which you've responded to COVID-19. I'm always struck by the public health messaging on the motorway system. Yeah. I think it's very, very good. You know, it, it just always, it's a constant uh, endorsement, if you like, of that message. But um, I have to say, Minister, you've been very strongly uh, defending your executive colleagues. I mean, because the, the, the amount of money given to your department does not feel to me that there is actually that willingness uh, to put uh, infrastructure as a key priority strategic ambition of this executive if we are to get the economy moving. You have mentioned uh, in your uh, comments about your um, dialogue with the logistics and freight industries, which is critical, but I'm also very concerned about the construction industries when we do start to get them back on an even footing again, because I'm sure the Federation, etc., aren't happy at all with the amount of money that's been uh, made available to your department. Um, could I just pick up on the planning one as well? Because uh, whilst there's uh, legislation, and I think in, in Ms Kimmins' um, comment about trying to get the uh, permission extended, I think there's a, an, a grey area that often is within planning about w when you, it's interpreted that actually the site work on the site has commenced. You know, there are some that when the founds are in. I've been, uh, as a councillor and, and an MLA in the past, I've heard it's when the site has been cleared and a fence has been put around it. And there always was. If you go from region to region within planning, there is different interpretation. So I would just urge you to have a wee uh, a look at around the interpretation end of it, because planning does at times uh, have some grey areas. Uh, I am very concerned about uh, the suggestion by the uh, finance minister around a furlocking, a furlocking of um, transport staff in particular, and I wonder has that uh, uh, been applied to staff right across the public sector, or is it just being looked at within uh, transport? And uh, the other, uh, in terms of that requirement for a comprehensive spending review, I mean, was that something that was uh, each department was asked to do? And what does uh, you said something about sharing of resources? What actually does that mean? 
Okay. Uh, and then uh, the other, sorry, we just I have waited a long time. Um, <laughs> the other bit um, uh, was uh, around, yeah, there was that was the capital bid. Sorry, the, but yes, the COVID-19, why is it, why is it that infrastructure is the only department that has not received, received COVID-19 funding, and yet we've seen a number of initiatives being brought forward by your department. I find it very hard to understand that. Okay. Okay. Um, on the public health messaging, I, I think that's been very powerful and want to thank uh, Traffic Watch NI for assisting us in getting very important and powerful messages. Um, yesterday, we changed the signs to uh, mark um, uh, Workers Memorial Day. I think that was a really important thing and we've had really good feedback from people that the messages are resonating uh, and we will continue to play our part for the duration of this crisis in making sure that we <coughs> play in our part in getting the public health messages out there. Um, in terms of uh, infrastructure, um, if you look around the world, um, places recognise that if you want to transform your society and your economy and you want to tackle the global crisis that is uh, the climate emergency, infrastructure is key. It's the foundation upon which you build everything else. Um, and uh, this is particularly important now and should be resonating more when we're in the middle of this crisis and we know what we need to do to come through it. As you rightly point out, the construction sector um, is key. Uh, in terms of our economy and building that infrastructure, and it will be critical as we as we move from recovery. And my department has a key role uh, to play in that. Um, in terms of the case law that you reference, I've been very specific and careful in the language that I use. You know, unless primary legislation, new primary legislation is put in place, the options are you either renew or you commence work. For the commencements of work, there is a body of case law. So I would just urge anybody who is considering to do that to make sure that they are well advised on what they need to do, because I wouldn't like someone to undertake works at expense to realise that that actually didn't qualify as commencement. You know, um, I know that the chief, plan uh, chief uh, planning officer is in contact with councils. You know, I'll ask him is he engaging with them on that matter as well. On the issue of furlough, and the Minister for Finance did write to all government departments um, on the issue. I just think it's a, it's a very uh, significant decision. It's one that needs to be taken collectively um, by the executive, um, and it needs to be done in um, consultation with workers and, and with the trade unions. I'm very clear on that. Um, Sometimes when we look at these issues and we think that they present solutions, uh, Andrew Moore raised the issue of being prepared for public sector or for public transport as we emerge from this um, a crisis. And I mentioned about the need for social distancing and the need for fleet. So we will have to have more buses on the road for smaller passenger numbers. We will need drivers and all of the critical staff that work for Translink to keep those buses and trains clean, to keep them on the road. So um, on the face of it, sometimes these things look like wonderful solutions. But when you start to work through the practicalities and the details of them, um, you know, there's a wider picture to take cognizance of. And of course, you know, none of these decisions should be taken without consultation with the trade unions themselves. On the issue of comprehensive spending, yes, the Finance Minister did ask all departments to review spending. When I talk about pulling, um, pulling funds across government departments, I think of examples such as community transport. Community transport has stepped up over and beyond in playing its part in the fight back. We were able to assist them by providing the funding, continuing their funding, but they have stepped up in delivering medicines, food parcels, shopping to very vulnerable people. But community transport is largely used to take people to health appointments. So I should be working with the Minister of Health to see what we can do with the Minister for Agriculture as well, um, to see what we can do across our departments to support community transport, to be able to support people who are particularly isolated in our rural communities. So that's the kind of thinking that I have when I talk about having this co cooperative partnership approach to problems and opportunities. But can I just, well, I mean, the, the, uh, from a rural area myself, I know the value of community transport and the role that it plays. I think all MLAs would, would recognise that. But it is important then that a message goes, I think, to the Finance Minister that they should release some central funding for infrastructure. I just haven't got an answer yet as to why infrastructure stands alone and isolated. Mr. Boyle, you have a short question? Just a very short question. Two short questions, one each. Um, Minister, <laughs> Minister, just in relation to uh, the conversation we had with the driving test, 
Is there a consideration to provide transport in the absence of people not being able to take their tests, who are key workers or front line? Is there a consideration to provide? I'm only throwing it out there no, no. to provide transport. You mentioned community transport. There may be an option there for it. I don't know. And just to Katrina, in relation to the legislation, um, I appreciate in terms of the regulatory section 51, the the Taxes Act. Is there not an opportunity to introduce emergency powers for a one-off payment for taxis, or where would that sit? Does that sit in a different department? Just for, taxis. Or, do you want me to go first? Yeah, yeah. So, yes, I, I can see, and that's why I've said I'm keeping this situation under constant review. Um, I said that, that why I'm holding back is because I need to have a clear understanding of unintended consequences uh, of doing that. Um, and what I would really not like to do is to do something for very good, um, well intentions, and then for that to actually encourage people onto our public transport. Uh, um, and engaging with each other and not uh, adhering to the clear advice to stay at home and only engage in essential travel. So that's the balance that I always have to, to be weighing up. But I've always said from the beginning of this that the way through this crisis is to be creative and it's to work together. Um, we are seeing um, through the Department of Communities and Councils, we're seeing it in our own communities, we're seeing it with community transport. People are doing things in a new way and they're working together. So I'm always on the lookout for how we can find creative ways to use, say, community transport or others to, pe to be providing support to our essential key workers. So it's something that I can go back and discuss in particular with the community transport sector. Um, I am definitely up for looking at things. My reticence around the public transport network is the practical workings of it means you have to offer it free to to everybody and we have to be mindful as an assembly that that could have very damaging unintended consequences thank you yeah. just to, to pick up on the the taxis act it, it goes back also to the specific responsibilities of the minister's department which are very firmly in the regulatory space and that crossover then between our responsibilities for regulation of certain transport, but also then the point that the Minister and I were making earlier around at what point do you look at this as a, as a thriving, in normal circumstances, business sector and what business support is available, and, and that takes it into you know, at least a couple of other departments? I think the, the issue here is that we have recognised that um, businesses uh, and workers have been really badly affected by this and there's been a number of financial packages. Some uh, can be availed of by, by different people in the industry, some can't. Uh, and I suppose it's an issue of we have to be clear where responsibility lies. I will do everything that I can as Minister for Infrastructure with responsibility for regulation. Um, I have executive colleagues who have remit and responsibilities that, you know, are that that the taxi industry are seeking support from, and I think that we need to look and examine the possibility of providing financial assistance to taxi drivers, but that would be a matter for the Minister for Economy and the Minister for Finance. Okay, thank you. Minister, do you have an update on the issue of the relaxation of um, vehicle maximum weight limits? I know it's been raised a few times with you, but... Yes, um, so uh, we're aware that this um, is an issue particularly um, facing one uh, company in particular, and I asked for my officials to directly engage with that company as well as with representatives, um, and that engagement is ongoing. So that is being explored directly with the company because I do recognise that they have raised it as an issue. My understanding is that it is part of contingency planning <coughs> as opposed to an immediate and pressing need, um, but the offic my officials are engaging to see what we can do to support that company given its important role um, in the agri-food sector. Okay, thank you. And we have um, the regulation before us today in relation to electric bikes. I suppose it could be debatable yeah. whether it's COVID-related or it could be in relation to obviously um, health and being able to get out and so on. But uh, what do you plan? When do you plan to um, to move this? So we are in discussions with the business office to try to secure a date, um, and I've asked for that date at the earliest opportunity. Um, I think businesses focused on COVID-19. I would argue that this actually could sit with that because um, it is about um, safe, active uh, travel. Um, so as soon as I can possibly get a date, um, I would be keen to move on this as quickly as possible. Okay, thank you. And there will obviously be an opportunity for us to speak with you again on Tuesday, I understand? Yes. At ad hoc? Ad yeah. yeah. Is it? Ad yeah. A statement at the, in, in the chamber? Not many. Um, 
There aren't any further questions at this stage, so can I, I thank you and your officials for, for coming this morning, and obviously there'll be other opportunities. And obviously we, had the, we didn't get the opportunity to speak to, to John directly today, but I'm sure that will be That's rectified fine, sure. in the near future. <laughs> Many other opportunities. <laughs> well, thank John, you very much. John done his job the last day, sorry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. On the issue of, of the uh, electric bike and uh, SLR, uh, should we be writing to the business office highlighting? We're, we're going to we'll come okay. to that just in the point. It's a, it's a noisy one. <laughs> No, no, I'm going to be cold. Okay. Sorry? Have we? Oh, that's all right. Be out of here. Oh, that's, that's okay. Good. Okay. Um, well. Just in, um, just to reflect, to reflect on that, um, that session, um, are members content that um, staff review? Um, I don't. We're, we're not clear whether hats are were here or yeah. not. Maybe they were. Maybe they were taking note from, from elsewhere, but um, but to review that session and if there's any additional questions from that. Mm -hmm. There's also um, a piece from Assembly Research um, and they have a number of questions and if members are content that we, we put those as part of our scrutiny back to the department as well just to see if there's any further information that we can glean from that in anticipation and preparation of the um, debates. Great. Mr Muir. Yeah, the question was asked during today's session about whether the department will have enough um, financial cover uh, until the budget process comes about, and the answer was no to that. And it's just how do we address that? Because that's obviously a serious concern that that situation is evolving. That may be something I think that that's something that maybe the committee needs to write to the finance committee in relation to. We can write straight to the, the finance, finance minister. Well, to that Dallow. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Just on that subject, there is going to be another vote of an account. Yes. For departments that don't have enough money to deal with till the next till the budget is free. Yeah. Sorry, I can't hear. Can't hear. Can't, 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 Sorry. can't hear. It's going to be another vote in account in the next few weeks, apparently, for departments that don't have enough money to get them through to the budget. Being this agreed. isn't the only department that is obviously That's having financial apparently. difficulties. So I think there are five mm. departments. So um, there'll be an opportunity at that. Chair, could, we, could, could we ask the, um, the finance minister, is he getting any communication back from, from the British government with regards to trying to plug the hole of the austerity money that was taken from here? Because therein lies the problem for a number of departments, because they're trying to plug holes that was already there before, before COVID. So if we could get a, an update as to if there's any conversations going on about the money that was taken from the finances that was taken from the budget and to see if there's any kind of replacement going to happen there. Okay, Chair, could I further to that point ask about the new decade, new approach uh, yep, uh, yep. monies uh, and commitments? You know, how, I know that the Minister had been back and forth to the Treasury. Yep. Uh, I, I can understand where I mean, nobody thought we'd be in this sort of situation, having to deal with this sort of crisis ever. Um, but I do think it's important we are appraised of that. And the previous commitments by the British uh, Prime Minister uh, around turbocharging infrastructure, yep. you know, as well. I mean, uh, there was money, uh, as you know, put aside uh, any Barnet consequentials. There are Barnet consequentials referred to in the budget, but whether or not they've come down to the departments um, that, mm. that uh, they were related to in, in uh, Westminster. Obviously, things have moved on quite considerably. Oh, I know. Seems a lifetime away, doesn't it? Um, okay, so members content with yep. those yeah, actions? Exactly. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much. Moving on then on to correspondence. Just draw your attention to correspondence. What page, what page is that on? Just, I'm, I'm lost. I'm sorry? What page? Oh, I'm just going to say that. Sorry. Page 137. 137, okay. So there's a, there's a table at 137, which is obviously there's a, there have been quite a number of um, pieces of correspondence and various, various suggested actions against each. Are members content to note those that have been noted? Great. Yep. Um, there are a number of items which maybe require further discussion, if or if you're content with the actions that are associated with each of those. Oh, great. 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 Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, page two eight one. There was correspondence from the Northern Ireland taxi drivers just in relation to PSV licensing. Um, that's obviously been explored, as has um, the 
um, tabled mm -hmm. correspondence which we'd received. Are you content just that um, we note again? Sure, just, or just on that, it's, it's, I don't mind. We we'll welcome that in terms of renewals. What happens in first timers? Anything in relation to you, you know, this, this come in at PSV, yeah, it's a renew the license, but there's people who go in for isn't there first timers? First -timers. That, same, same as the, the four year rule in the MOTs. So, can we ask them about that? Right. Yeah, okay, content we do that, yep. okay. Um, page um, 315 of obviously the written ministerial statement regarding um, the DVA lifts and audits. Um, that might be something that we want to we need, explore we need to look, yeah, again. We need to look at it again. Need, um, Absolutely. A bit yeah. more time on that in the future if you're content mm -hmm. to park that at this stage. Okay. Chair, so, see, just in relation to, to that particular mm -hmm. one, and, and it may be just my lack of understanding of what's been said, but I'm not getting a real sense that the specifications for the new lifts. Um, are going to cater for for the demand, and I'm just wondering about the procurement of lifts. And surely there would be a specification with it to give us a sense that they're not just robust enough. I know the the minister is very clear that she's going to stand over the reporting of it and making sure that the maintenance and what happened in the past won't happen again. But it's just to understand what is being purchased. Um, because when we asked that the last time around the specification of it, there was a bit of a grey area response given to us that I didn't find it very clear. Yeah, I think we, at that stage we, they were exploring it because it was a new, it was a new lift, yeah, um, yeah. So which had new specification. Yeah. So obviously it wasn't something that was all, that we'd already had or that we were currently using. So this was a new model. Yeah. But if we are, if you are content, that we'll we'll schedule. Schedule that again for a future meeting. After COVID. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Moving then on to um, subordinate legislation or SL1s, which are not subject to proceedings. Page 368, um, the Taxis Carrick Fergus Order, Northern Ireland 2020. This rule is not subject to any assembly procedure and is not required to be led. The rule will introduce a stand for taxis on a length of Lancasterian Street. Lancasterian Street. Yes, um, in Carrick Fergus, <laughs> and prescribe the conditions under which it can be used. The stand is available for use at any time, and a maximum of four taxis may use it at any one time. No vehicle other than a taxi is permitted to use the stand. The proposed taxi stand is being introduced as part of a public realm scheme following complaints from Mid and East Antrim Borough Council and local taxi companies and following a site visit with these stakeholders. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rule? Great. Great. Thank you. I, will, I just want to say if they don't, uh, if they don't get taxi people grants soon, there's not going to be many taxis to use such a stand. <laughs> so we need to try well, and find a way of helping. This is in preparation. Yeah. Yeah. And, so hope, a page, and hopefully get the grant. Page 370. The Taxis Port Stewart Order, um, Northern Ireland 2020. This rule is not laid, subject to any assembly procedure and is not required to be led. The rule will remove a, sta a taxi stand on the length of Coleraine Road, Port Stewart, and revoke and reenact three other taxi stands so the taxi provision in Port Stewart is consolidated into one order. The stand is being removed at the request of local residents. The residents' concerns are that people congregate outside their homes in the early hours of the morning, causing a nuisance with noise and litter. The department is satisfied that the existing taxi stands in the area are sufficient to cater for de taxi demand. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rule? Great. Thank you. Page 372, the Taxis Macrofeld Order, Northern Ireland 2020. Again, this rule is not subject to any assembly procedure and is not required to be led. The rule will introduce a, ta a stand for taxis on the length of Market Street, Macrofeld, and prescribe the conditions under which it can be used. The stand will be available for use from 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. on all days, and a maximum of four taxis may use the stand at any one time. No vehicle other than a taxi is permitted to use the stand during specific hours. The proposed taxi stand is being introduced at the request of the local MLA and taxi drivers to improve facilities for taxis and their users. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rule? Great. Thank you. SL1 amendments to the Motor Vehicles Wearing of Seatbelts Regulations Northern Ireland 1993 at page 375. The Department for Infrastructure proposes to make a statutory rule to provide a qualified exemption from the requirement to wear a seatbelt for certain persons riding in a motor ambulance. 
The exemption applies where the person is providing urgent medical attention or treatment, which, due to its nature or the medical situation of the patient, cannot be delayed. It is not anticipated that the exemption would extend to the driver of the ambulance. The statutory rule is subject to affirmative resolution procedure before the Assembly. As such, there will be provision for an Assembly debate. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rule? Great. Great. Thank you. SL1, the Craigs Road, Carrick Fergus Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland, 2020, at page 388. This rule is subject to negative resolution procedure in the Assembly. The rule will abandon an area footpath at Craigs Road, Carrick Fergus, after the completion of such works as the Department considers necessary to provide alternative facilities. The abandonment has been requested so that the, the area of road in question may be incorporated into the property that has been built on the land adjacent to number 123 Craigs Road, North, um, Carrick Fergus. The abandonment will allow work to be completed as per the approved planning application. The bed and soil of the area of the road to be abandoned is owned by a third party and the applicants for the abandonment are in the process of having it transferred to their ownership by deed of transfer. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rule? Thank you. SL1, the Drumnagoon Road and Cairn Hill Road in Port Down, Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland, 2020, at page 392. This rule is subject to negative resolution procedure in the Assembly. The rule will abandon an area of Kernan Hill Road, Port Down, after the completion of such works as the Department considers necessary to provide uh, alternative facilities for road traffic. The abandonment has been requested by a developer to facilitate a new housing development at this location. The bed and soil of part of the area of the road to be abandoned is owned by this department and the remainder is um, owned by the Department for Communities. Following the coming into operation of the abandonment order, the land will be declared surplus and disposed of in accordance with the statutory procedures laid down for the disposal of government-owned land. Are the members content with the proposals for the statutory rule? Agreed. Okay, SL1, the Kernan Road, uh, Port Down, Footpath Abandonment Order Northern Ireland 2020, and it's at page 396. This rule is subject to negative resolution procedure in the Assembly. The rule will abandon an area of road at Kernan Road, Porta Down, commencing at its junction with the footway on the north side of Kernan Gardens. The abandonment has been requested by a developer to facilitate realignment of the footpath. The developer is registered owner of the bed and soil of the area to be abandoned. Following the abandonment, the area will revert to the registered owners to be incorporated into the adjacent property, while an alternative footpath will be constructed. Are members content with the proposals of the statutory rule? Great. Great. Thank you. SL1, the footpath at Mullen Road and Bunker Hill, Market Hill, abandonment order Northern Ireland 2020 at page 400. This rule is subject to negative resolution procedure in the Assembly. The rule will abandon an area footpath at Moen Road and Munger Hill, Market Hill. The abandonment has been requested by the Education Authority to facilitate the construction of a 2G pitch play park and car parking adjacent to Market Hill Primary School. The Education Authority is the owner of the bed and soil of the area to be abandoned. Following the abandonment of the land um, will be incorporated into the school building. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rule? Thank you. SL1, the Taxis um, Licensing Amendment Coronavirus Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and it's at page 404. Members will note that this proposal was considered via correspondence on the 8th of April 2020, in which members gave their approval for the proposal and ratification, ratified under matters arising. This is for the purpose of having a formal record of the agreement. SL1, the Planning Development Management Temporary Modifications Coronavirus Regulation Northern Ireland 2020, and that's at page 408. Um, members will note that this proposal was considered via correspondence on the 24th of April 2020, in which members gave their approval for the proposal and ratified under matters rising. This is again is for the purpose of having a formal record of the agreement. Item 15, subordinate legislation, SRs, not subject to assembly proceedings. At page 412, we have SR 2020-38, um, which is the, the Parking Places Disabled Persons Vehicles Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 4th um, of March 2020 and was content. The rule is not subject to assembly resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Great. Thank you. 
So that the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR um, 2020 38, the Parking Places Disabled Persons Vehicles Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Moving then to item 16, which is SR um, 2020 31, which is the electrically assisted. Um, pedal Cycles Construction and Use Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 at page 418. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 4th of March 2020 and was content. The examiner of statutory rules has no issues to raise. The rule is subject to affirmed resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Great. Great. That the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-31, the Electrically Assisted Pedal Cycles Construction and Use Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Mr Beggs, you wanted to make comment in relation to this? Which one's this, Riley? The Electric Bikes. Oh, right, just, I think we should be um, uh, writing to the Business Committee if they have not prioritised it, highlighting the fact that this uh, uh, legislation will actually help during this period. Okay. Members content? Yep. Great. Thank you. Moving then to item 17, which is SR 2020 39, the Motorways Traffic Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and it's page 445. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 19th of February 2020 and was content. The examiner's statutory rules has no issues to raise. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There's been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Sure. Isn't this the one we discussed with one of our visits, wasn't it? Yes. To the extent, and we, we talked about being aligned with road safety and all at that yes. time, and that's the question. Okay, just checking. Yeah. In fact, I, I think um, officials were here and we spoke to them. We did. That's what I said, just for <coughs> Okay. Okay, so that the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020 39, the Motorways Traffic Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule. My item 20, which is SR 2020-64, the Taxis Licensing Amendment Coronavirus Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, at page 462. Members will note this SR was considered via correspondence on the 9th of April 2020, in which members gave their approval for the SR and was ratified under ma uh, matters arising. And again, this is for the purpose of having a formal record of the agreement. Um, and I also advise you that there is an additional item, um, agenda item consider to consider the statutory rule and we'll then move to an agenda item number 21 table papers uh, which is SR 2020 72 and that's the planning development management temporary modifications coronavirus regulations Northern Ireland 2020 and it's tabled at page 32 and the proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 24th of April 2020 via correspondence. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Members content? Mm -hmm. Great. So the Committee for Infrastructure is considered SR 2020-72, the Planning, Development, Management, Temporary Modifications, Coronavirus Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner's statutory rules report has no objection to the rule. Can I highlight the guidance? Oh, it's not the one that needed to get. There's no guidance out yet. It's to come out on Friday. Pardon? Friday. Friday. It is out now? It's coming out on Friday. Friday. OK, yeah. but we're proving advance of guidance. You thought we'd, that, that's been my re 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 reservation. OK, thank you. OK. OK, then moving then to any other business of members, anything that they wish Sorry. to read the stage? Ms Kelly? Thank you, Chair. It's just to pick up on... Um, whether or not it's just more clarification. We had agree, uh, agreed, or I thought Mr. Boyle mentioned would be about writing in support of the minister and the, and the expressing concern around the shortfall mm. across uh, the budget. And um, perhaps it might be useful to alert other committees in relation to the taxi grants that are uh, the responsibility of the economy and maybe finance in terms of doing some work together on it. Maybe to, uh, I think because. Uh, uh, I think we're all inundated with messages from taxi drivers, but people, I think, need to have a very clear message where uh, the decision lies. Is there something that uh, communities could do in relation to that? Yes, um, there has been talk before about um, the min our minister talking to the Minister of Communities regarding taxis being used for like delivering shopping and things like that. Well, maybe something that we want to raise with... with all yeah. three. And, and, yeah. and could we also ask why? And health as well, of course. Sorry. 
co the, the, that there's but no funding has gone to the Department of Infrastructure. It seems very strange on COVID-19. You know, why is that? Chair, okay. sure, I, I, would, I, I wouldn't put it in the context of... I, I agree with what uh, Dolores is saying. The, the question I ask, in, in this pandemic case, there's other departments has been able to introduce emergency powers, right? So, I mean, I, I didn't, that's why I asked the question. I mean, we haven't time to interrogate the Taxes Act at the minute. But I mean, um, there is a legal advice that suggests that the 2008 Section 51 is the regulatory issue. Um, I, you know, like I say, we don't have time to interrogate that to see exactly could it be changed. All I'm saying is, if we certainly would write to all the departments to see where the responsibility would lie if we could introduce a an emergency power to facilitate, like in this case, the tax industry. That's all. I mean, but. I wouldn't be over emphasizing the point of whose responsibility let's find out whose responsibility it is. It's also a sounding issue in relation it should to be, by right it should be an executive possibly could fall within an executive issue completely. There's also the issue, yeah, standing issue which obviously explored today and at the COVID meeting with regards to planning. Um, yeah, but the Minister was very clear, you know, that her hands were tied in relation to the grant and it was a decision to be made elsewhere. So I, I, and I do think that's a message that we need. Uh, for the taxi drivers to know if they're wanting to be successful in their lobbying, where they need to lobby. Economy and finance. Okay. So, if you contend, then we're right to economy and finance. Okay. In relation yeah. to that aspect. Um, any other issues? Um, just in relation to a future meeting, have members any consideration at this stage, or are you content that we let by year over the next um, number of days, really, just to see, and, and we'll be in communication then with you if there's something that we feel that we need to. Have further discussion on. Um, I think we may need to. Um, we will need to revisit the issue around our budget. Um, so it will be important for us to have um, a presentation uh, and further scrutiny of that um, in the next number of weeks. Um, so if you're content, then we. I'm need happy, it, happy enough with that. that stage. But I know that the business committee, you know, the speakers going away and looking at papers because this is going to be the new normal for some considerable time, and we will. And other devolved assemblies are. You know, there's a piece of work of research going on about how we're going to move forward uh, in preparing for uh, the next um, 12 to 18 months. So, well, yeah. look, again, we'll thank, thank members for, for coming here today. Obviously, it, it's made. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry, and I didn't that's say that's that's okay. Apologies. <laughs> Put me in the corner today. <laughs> um, but no, I, I do think we have a, an important role to to demonstrate that we're playing in the scrutiny um, of all of the information that we are receiving. And therefore, I would like a regular meeting, however that's done. Now, we may not have a situation, obviously, where the ministers here that all of us need to be in attendance, and we could probably work that out across the parties. That's what we're doing in some committees, so that there's only one member from each party actually physically present, and then the rest phoning in. But it would be good that we had a regular uh, meeting of some sort, however we have to take that forward. Okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll look to see how we need to do that and obviously what issues that we need to discuss in relation to that because I think there's no point in doing it just for the sake of no, no. meeting either. It needs to be with a, with a purpose. purpose. But um, obviously, um, thank members for, for coming today. It's Sorry, obviously still made... Two hours, yeah. Sorry? Is there still a time on a two hours for a meeting? Yeah. Well, it really very much depends on whenever you're booking and booking the room. So it's one hour 15. Um, but obviously, thank members for their attendance today. It's obviously made it much easier for us the fact mm -hmm. that you know you've, you have been here yeah. um, because I know there have been issues um, doing sort of the electronic um, um, the video conferencing as well. But and also thank staff obviously for, for coming to you. Very much appreciate their work and obviously they're working behind the scenes in, in um, yeah. forwarding papers and so on to us um, in a timely manner. So thank you very much for, for thank your you. efforts. Thank you. So if members are content. Um, we will adjourn. Thank you. Thank you. Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber.